Good afternoon and welcome to Harold Talk on www.radioharoldhill.co.uk and today's guest on the show is John and he will be talking to us about the Baha'i faith. Uh, welcome to the show, John. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a bit about yourself and how you came to be a Baha'i? Well, I was born in the last phases of the war. Um, my father was in the Royal Air Force and was killed in the war. And um, my family was uh, an Anglican family. My, my uncle and aunt, in fact, were Christian missionaries in Africa. But my mother had lost her faith in the war, and she also felt she'd been indoctrinated into the Anglican faith, and she was convinced. Well, I went to a Sunday school and came back talking about death, and she didn't like that in a five-year-old child, so she stopped me going to the Sunday school. And one of the things that perplexed me as I grew up was that uh, why was one religion right and all the others wrong, when they all seemed to say roughly the same thing? How could a just God have favourites? Pick one religion and you lot are coming into heaven and the other lot are going into hell no matter how good they are. That didn't compute. And so when a lady I was very fond of told me about the Baha'i faith, I thought, well that sounds interesting. I was initially more interested in the lady than the faith but I used to go along to meetings with her and gradually, gradually I became attracted to the notion that there is one religion. It comes to different places at different times. It teaches humanity what humanity needs to know at any one time. And it continues to progress. And so it doesn't matter of one faith right or the others wrong. They're all right, just different stages, different phases of one faith. And that sounded very good. Now I, had, I was living in Havering at the time, but I was in the civil service and that moved to Worcester. So I had to continue my research in Worcester by getting books into the public library. There were no Baha'is in Worcester. The thing that perplexed me was, would I be leaving Christ if I joined the Baha'i faith? Was this deserting Christ? And it was only when I read a book called Thief in the Night, which went through all the biblical prophecies and pointed out how they all pointed towards the Baha'i faith for Christ's return, that I actually became a Baha'i. So I became a Baha'i from Christianity, believing that Baha'u'llah is Christ returned, and also the promised one for all the different faiths. And that was 45 years ago, so I've been in it for quite a time now. Uh, what is the Baha'i faith, and how did it get started? Well, it began in Iran in 1844. It, there was a herald called the Bab. He was a merchant from Shiraz, and at the time, there was a great expectancy of the coming of the promised one of Shia Islam. The year 1260 had been touted as the year for this happening. And if you look in Revelations, 1260 appears all over the place. And this, at this time was a time when, in Christianity, there was a great expectancy around the year 1844. Because Christians were saying... This is actually 2,300 years after Daniel's prophecy of the abomination of desolation. That was mentioned by Christ. Christian missionaries are pouring into Africa. The Christian faith is being taught to the world. That was mentioned by Christ. There's been an edict of toleration signed by the Ottoman Empire. Jews can now return to Jerusalem. The time of the Gentiles has been fulfilled. That was mentioned by Christ. So they waited, 1844, for Christ to come down on the cloud. But they expected it to be literal, and it wasn't. But in Iran, 18 believers independently recognized the Bab as the promised one, the first of two promised ones promised to Islam. And they followed the Bab for some years. <laughs> there were martyrdoms, the Bab was imprisoned, uh, and in 1850 he was martyred in sensational circumstances because there was a hadith in Islam that the promised one would be killed by Muslims so they picked a Christian regiment and as they took the barb through the streets the people called out the same things they called out to Christ if you're the promised one, save yourself God can come and save you and the Christian commander was very uneasy about this this reminded him of Calvary and he said to the Bab, well, 
I don't want to do this. You're a holy man, and I'm a Christian. And the Bible said you have to do your duty. But if you're sincere, trust in God. Let God solve it for you. And so these 750 muskets with 10,000 people around the barrack square in Tabriz where this took place in 1850 fired and after the smoke had died away on the ground were shattered ropes and the barb was finishing dictating to his secretary in his cell so Sam Khan the Christian commander had believed in God and God had indeed solved it for him he marched his troops away and a Muslim regiment came in and finished it so that was the bar, but the bar had spoken always of one whom God would make manifest. And in 1852, there was another wave of persecution against the Barbies, who the Barb's followers have called. It's estimated something like 20,000 were killed in the streets in those days. And one was a, merch, uh, uh, a man from Tehran who was put in prison in the black pit of Tehran. And he was one of the foremost Barbies, and many people thought he was the holiest. And that's where he had an intimation in this deep dungeon in Tehran that he was the promised one the Barb had spoken of. But he said nothing about it. He was exiled to Baghdad, and he went to the mountains of Sulaymaniyah because of other, there was disunity amongst the Barbies. Other people were saying they were the promised one and so on. So he left so they could sort it out. And he was there for two years before news filtered through to Baghdad of this holy man in the mountains. They realised who it was and they came and asked him to come back and he returned. And uh, but he still didn't tell me exactly who he was, although they were very much attracted to him. Until, and this is going to be a later, later question, I think, until Rizwan. But the Baha'i faith has blossomed from that. It's now in all countries of the world. And it teaches the oneness of humanity, the oneness of God, the oneness of the human race, the oneness of religion. You, world unity is the major teaching of the Baha'i faith all through the world. Uh, what are the principal tenets of the faith? Uh, well, apart from the one list, there are all kinds of uh, subsidiary ones, I suppose. One is that you should never say anything bad about someone. Backbiting is totally out of this. You should, if you can find one good thing to say about a person, say it. So if, for example, you know about Al Capone, and you know that when... <laughs> someone shot up a restaurant in which Al Capone was it missed him but the lady at the table nearby got glass in her eye and was likely to lose her sight there's something good you can say about Al Capone because he paid the $5,000 for her sight to be saved so if you know something good about someone focus on that not on their faults because they might be looking at your faults and so you don't look at the faults of others you look at yourself one other very important thing is the independent search for truth we should have an unfettered search for truth the only valid reason for belonging to a religion is that you believe it if it's your family's religion that's only valid if you believe it if the people around you believe it it's whether you believe it you should investigate for yourself it should be an unfettered investigation and you should join it because of your own beliefs so the children of Baha'is are taught about all faiths but they cannot be pressured into becoming Baha'is it's entirely their decision and no one else's then all the other teachings are about bringing the world together you must have an auxiliary language one that we can all speak so the way I go to a foreign country I can latch on to the auxiliary language and be understood. There's many hopeful British Baha'is who hope this is going to be English, but we don't know that. So that brings people together. And then there's all kind of a world currency, anything to do with the world. The nations must come together. One of the things Baha'u'llah said was that the kings and rulers of the world should come together in a great assembly and work out the problems of the world by negotiation and consultation 
that's a major principle so all the principles that are to do with oneness and unity science and religion Bahá'u'lláh says are two wings of a bird they must go side by side if you've got too much science then the inventions you come up with are likely to be weapons of mass destruction and things that are wholly destructive for the human race if on the other hand religion is too strong then you have superstition you have Galileo tortured because he discovered some fact that didn't accord with the beliefs of the people around him so you need a balance you need science religion has to be hand in hand and similarly uh, the rights of men and women must be the same equality of the sexes is very much a, a plank in the Baha'i faith uh, quite a sensational one when you consider Bahá'u'lláh was bringing this forth in Iran in the 19th century uh, again two wings of a bird uh, the eldest son of Bahá'u'lláh Abdul Bahá who Bahá'u'lláh said should, was the exemplar of his teachings said that until women had all the opportunities to do all the things they could do men would be deprived of doing all the things they could do in holding women back men hold themselves back so all these teachings are about unity and bringing people together there's lots more but I can't think of them <laughs> uh, the festival of Rifton, uh, what is it and how is it celebrated well I said that when Baha'u'llah was in Baghdad um, he hadn't declared his mission although many people, many more and more people were being attracted to him. Uh, and in 1863, so many people were being attracted to him that the Iranian government said that they wanted him farther away because people were going from Iran to Baghdad to see him. And so the, the Sultan of Turkey decided to exile him to Constantinople. And so many people wanted to come to Baha'u'llah's house on his last days that he rented a garden um, across the river from where he lived and this garden is called the Garden of Paradise Garden of Rizvan it's got an Arabic name as well but I won't worry you with that and that meant lots of people could be there with him and on the first day of Rizvan which in, uh, was about the 20, first 22nd of April he declared that he was the one that they had spoken of and they were all very happy about that because they inspected that so the, that's the festival of Rizwan is beginning it's the declaration of Baha'u'llah to the world that he is the promised one of all nations and one of the first commands he gave was that there must be no holy war holy war is completely forbidden in the past you've had the crusades when the Christians had holy war You've had jihad, where the Muslims have holy war. Um, both of these, uh, well, the jihad particularly was supposed to be defensive, although it's been distorted of late. Um, well, Baha'u'llah said, out of order, no holy war. <coughs> and so that's completely forbidden. The first thing he said, <coughs> first command he gave from the Ram to Rizwan was holy war was abolished. Because humanity is one, and you're making war on your brothers and sisters, as it were. So he was in the garden for about 12 days. There were lots of roses around, which he distributed to people in the neighbouring places. There were nightingales singing. In the ninth day of Rizvan, which it happens to be today, 29th of April, uh, his family joined him. And on the 12th day of Rizvan, he left um, to go to Constantinople. A long, long journey by horseback. Um, and went to Constantinople and then further he was exiled a few months later in the middle of winter to Adrianople Constantinople is now Istanbul Adrianople is now Eden and uh, five years later he was exiled to Acre in Israel which is where the world's centre is so the festival of Israel is the, the celebration of the beginning of uh, his revelation so he'd been some ten years without actually telling everybody but they were all sort of overjoyed and, and finally confirming what they very much felt but Rizwan's a special festival for other reasons too because Bahá'u'lláh wrote down who should succeed him and this is unique in religious history 
Muhammad was silent on the subject. That's why you have Shia and Sunni Islam, because they don't agree on who should have succeeded Muhammad, and the Quran is silent on that. It was never quite clear in Christianity what the successorship should be. Christ mentioned to Peter upon this rock I'll be in my church, but it was Paul that wrote most of the epistles, and yet Christ said nothing to Paul about doing that. So you've had division in religions because of this. Baha'u'llah said that his eldest son, Abdul Baha, would be the exemplar of his faith and the interpreter of his words. And he also said that there would be no clergy in the Baha'i faith, that they would be, we would have elected assemblies of nine at local level, national level, and eventually the international level. Abdul Baha made a will and testament. His eldest grandson, Shoghi Effendi, was appointed the guardian, and he further elaborated on the elections, which would take place during the festival of Rizwan. Shoghi Effendi, in his turn, um, he, he had no children, but he, he elaborated on the administration, as he said, all kinds of details. And when he passed on, there were no more guardians, but six years later, the Universal House of Justice, that's the international body of nine, was elected for the first time. So Rizwan's vital as far as the administration is concerned. On the 21st of April, just a week ago, the Spiritual Assembly of Hayring was elected for the 50th time, something like that, just over 50 years, if you take Romford into consideration. I've just come back from the National Convention and I've just voted for the nine people to form the National Spiritual Assembly of the United Kingdom. I don't have a list, I don't have a short list, I vote for the nine people I think best embody qualities of unquestioned loyalty, steadfast devotion, a well-trained mind, mature experience, recognised ability, combination of, of ability and steadfastness. Every five years, the National Spiritual Assemblies elect the Universal House of Justice in Haifa. And again, they don't have any short lists, they vote for the nine they feel would be the appropriate it's rather different for the election we are coming up to. Um, so we have no nominations, no candidates. We vote for the nine people. And that's why this one's so important. It's, it's not just the, the declaration of Baha'u'llah, the recognition of Baha'u'llah as the manifestation of God for this age, but the administration of the Baha'i faith is centred on Rizwan and the elections of Rizwan. Uh, why are the Baha'is persecuted and what is so revolutionary about the Baha'i faith and its teachings? In the history, religions have also always been persecuted at their birth. Christ said to the scribes and Pharisees, O oh, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you say if you'd been around in the days of the prophets, you would not have been amongst those who stoned the prophets. I say to you, you're the children of those who stoned the prophets. In other words, whenever a messenger of God comes, he's persecuted. He's opposed and particularly opposed by the clergy of the previous dispensation because he doesn't come in the way they think he should. And also, it disrupts their power. And in Iran, it's been the clergy that have been most virulent against the Baha'i faith. It was... Uh, and it, self-seeking government officials. The Bab was very keen to meet with the Shah at the time. He was prevented by the Prime Minister of Iran at the time, so that meeting didn't take place. And of course, Islam has this writing in the Quran, the fifth surah, where Muhammad signals an end to his revelation. It's the final surah in the Quran and he, he says, this is effectively, this is it, this is your religion, it's all perfected, all complete, um, and so on. But he's talking about his revelation. But Muslims have taken this to mean revelation forever. And so they can't cope with the fact that it isn't revelation forever, it's the end of Muhammad's revelation. So they persecute Baha'is on that count. They persecute them as heretics. Um, it's been officially promulgated by an Egyptian court in the 1920s that you could not regard Baha'is as Muslims because 
they have all these different teachings. They have a, we have a different calendar, for example. Our fast is according to that calendar. Our holy places are in Baghdad and Tehran and Israel. Uh, we have teachings totally advanced from the Quran. Um, we have some that are in common, like we do not drink alcohol or gamble. So it's it's that's I think why there's persecution. It's also power bases threatened. There's no clergy in the Baha'i faith, so the mullah would be out of a job if the Baha'i faith spread. So, I mean that's uh, other uh, other reasons you, you'd have to ask them. In, ignorance has a lot of to do with persecution, um, and there's persecution at the moment see, in Iran. The National Assembly was arrested some years ago and sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. There was a song a few years ago released about a 16-year-old girl called Mona who was executed for teaching children the Baha'i faith. So you're not talking a a responsible, level-headed society. There hasn't uh, been any overt persecution in England as far as I'm aware (laughs) but there might be one day who knows it sounds very much like a universal religion taking the human and earthly elements of each to form a new religion of sorts Um, is that a fair assessment well I think if you look at religion and one of the things that attracted me to the faith was the fact that I'd seen in other religions a likeness if you look at the precepts for a lay Buddhist you mustn't tell lies, you mustn't kill, you mustn't steal, you mustn't commit adultery. Doesn't that remind you of the Ten Commandments? If you, if you work on the premise that all religions come from the same source, they're all going to have elements in common. And spiritually, those elements are almost identical. The, 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 you turn away from the material things of life and think about the spiritual things. But materialism is, is a great sort of shimmer or an illusion all faiths teach that so it's not so much a a pick and mix it's a matter of progression and so it is all religions point forward this is the latest stage so of course it's going to embody elements from previous religions because they've come from the same source so it's not it's a progression what changes really is not so much the spiritual message as the social message what Baha'u'llah's brought is the social message for what people need to know today, particularly unity, unity of race, unity of religion. The first, um, one of the first interracial marriages in the United States was conducted by Abdul Baha, black man, white woman, um, as a real signal that race is one. There's only one human race. There's no any divisions we try to make are, are, are completely erroneous. So, no, it isn't a pick and mix, it isn't eclectic. It's a natural development of all these faiths um, coming from the same source and now reaching their their culmination for this stage. Um, Can I be a Baha'i and still be a Christian, Muslim or a Buddhist? Well, you'll never stop being a Christian, Muslim or a Buddhist. I haven't stopped being a Christian in the sense that I, I still believe in Christ still believe in Christ's teachings but since I've accepted Baha'u'llah as Christ returned um, then I now believe in Baha'u'llah is the latest it's a bit like someone Jewish becoming a Christian can you be a Christian and still be a Jew well of course you still accept the Old Testament so it's not a matter of giving up it's a matter of going forward and accepting the latest revelation the only difficulty you'd have would be an atheist because then you'd start having to start believing in God. So you'd have to give up your disbelief, as it were. But no, you would you would continue to reverence you, the religion from which you came because Baha'u'llah is the fulfillment. If you were a Buddhist, you say, this is the Maitreya, this is the fifth Buddha. If you were a Hindu, you say, this is the latest incarnation of Krishna, this is the tenth of Arta. Uh, Zoroastrians would say, this is the Shah Bharam, this is our promised one. It's a matter of them all coming together and under the same roof, as it were. There's something Christ said, uh, others I have not of this fold. Them also must I bring, and there'll be one shepherd and one fold. And we believe these are the religions of humanity he was talking about, all coming to different places at different times. And we only know some of them. 
every little place in, in, on the earth has had these manifestations come. But of course, it's only in recent millennia that we've had evidence, uh, written evidence of them. Um, so there will be others out there that... Uh, well, I can speculate, but I don't know. <laughs> um, but you get signs of, of things that, that, like the, the Raztec religion that had this figure called Quetzalcoatl that taught against human sacrifice. They stuck him on a boat and sent him off to sea. And you can see there, this is the way that religions are treated. And they went off and had sac human sacrifice instead. Uh, and they had prophecies about the return of Quetzalcoatl. He had, he, was, he had a face of fire and he was dressed totally in black and he'd come this great winged bird from the east and the date as well and on that date Cortes in a big white ship with his big ginger beard wearing black who was Good Friday turned up on the exact time of the prophecy weird but they'd thrown out the, uh, their prophet as it were and they were, they were they'd gone into the the realms of human sacrifice and so whatever religion spirit they had it had totally disintegrated I forgot what the question was what were we talking about <laughs> <laughs> um, how does Baha'i hope to appeal to um, all well I think it's uh, it's all embracing I think it's all inclusive it teaches, I mean, the oneness of humanity, the oneness of humanity, it's, it's, it, oh, it's surely such an obvious thing now. It, agree, it certainly agrees with science on that. Um, and, of course, it embraces all faiths. That whatever faith you belong to, you can become a Baha'i without giving up what you believed before and, and, and looking at it as a fulfilment. So I think one of the things that attracted me again to the Baha'i faith was... I saw that. I saw people who had been in all kinds of different faiths all working together, all together as one, when outside the Baha'i faith it didn't seem to be working like that. I think this is why Baha'is are so active in organisations such as Interfaith. Um, there is one in Havering, done one of the members, um, which brings different faiths together. So, I mean, in the Havering Interfaith, for example, the committee has a Sikh on it, it has two Hindus, a Muslim, um, has some Christians and, and also some Baha'is. And we have, we've had meetings at the synagogue and uh, we've had a Buddhist member uh, who looks after our website. So it, it's, it's run by people of different faiths. I don't think there's a major faith that, that's not involved in it. Um, I mentioned Zoroastrian earlier. There are very few Zoroastrians. I don't know if there's any in Havering at all, but they've got a centre in um, Rainers Lane in West London. But there's only about 120,000, 150,000 in the world. So we don't have any Zoroastrians on the interfaith, but we'd have to be hard-pressed to find anyone. But it's inclusive in that sense. It doesn't deny any, any faith from the past. It's, it's the fulfilment of it. And so it's inclusive. And if you go to a high house of worship... We have this name for it, a Mashrak Alaska, which means dawning place of the mention of God. The house of worship is the centre of it, but there are all kinds of dependencies going to be built around an orphanage, a place for the aged, a hospital, all the kinds of things that humanity would need. If you go to one of those, they're all nine-sided, and nine is a special number for Baha'is because it's the number of unity. It's the highest number you get to before you get into double figures and start repeating numbers. And uh, anyone can go into a Baha'i house of worship and read from their holy book because the words spoken in the house of Baha'i house of worship are the words of God, the words of revealed scripture. No one is allowed to give a sermon because that's no longer the words of God. That's your interpretation. So a Jewish person can go into a Baha'i house of worship and read from the Torah. A Christian can read the Sermon on the Mount. A Muslim can read the Quran. Uh, Zoroastrian can read the Zenda Vesta Hindu can read the Bhagavad Gita Buddhist can read the Buddhist scriptures Sikh can read his writings um, it's open to everyone because the Baha'i faith is for the whole world there was a, an occasion it was on the front page of the Guardian years ago where a family had gone to Israel and the father had died and the son desperately tried to find a place for him to be buried but the father wasn't a fully paid up 
do as it were and so the Jewish cemetery cemetery said well no he's not a proper he's not properly in the Jewish faith and the Christian places said well he's not one he's got to belong to the church to be buried in the cemetery and in desperation they rang the Baha'i faith and the Baha'i said yes our cemetery is open to everyone and that I think is the all inclusiveness of the Baha'i faith that it includes everybody no one's left out it's it's for everyone and people don't have to go up their previous belief they can join it uh, and it's the fulfillment okay we're going to take a quick short break and we'll be back after this i resisted her silently resisted her you know um and she would beat me a lot you know just cut my back all the way down but i would never cry I, I would just stand there with my arms folded. <laughs> but perhaps, you know, my, my father was the, um, the champion boxer for Jamaica. So maybe I inherited certain things from him, that determination, that will. And I refused to cry. And so she would beat me, trying to make me cry. And I'm refusing to cry. For honest and thought-provoking discussions, tune in to Harold Talk on Radio Harold Hill, www.radioharoldhill.co.uk And welcome back to Harold Talk on www.radioharoldhill.co.uk And with us today is John, who's informing us about the Baha'i Faith. Um, what separates the Baha'i Faith from other Eastern Godman religions? Um... Not quite sure I know too much about Eastern <laughs> religions as such. Um, I think the thing, all inclusiveness, is the thing really that that it separates behind faith from. I mean, it separates them from. It's just that it, it expands it. It's more inclusive, I suppose. Obviously, Christianity it, it believes in Judaism. So, if you're a Christian, then you also believe in the, in the mission of Moses and Abraham before that. If you're a Muslim, you believe in Christ and then <laughs> Moses and Abraham before that. Um, the high faith takes that on and, and extends it to the Eastern religions as well. And so it, it includes it all. Um, and I think the, the key thing about, uh, I think particularly the, the search for truth is one of the major ones. One of the writings of Baha'u'llah, he wrote a book called The Hidden Words. He says, um, O oh best beloved, the best beloved in my sight is justice. By its aid thou shalt see through thine own eyes and not through the eyes of others. Shalt note of, know of thine own knowledge and not to the knowledge of thy neighbour. Ponder this in thy heart, how it behoveth this to be. Verily, just, justice is my gift to thee, turn not away therefrom. And so any sort of investigation, know of your own knowledge, not the knowledge of your neighbour. It's a matter of investigation for yourself. So uh, it differs, I suppose, in one sense in that we believe that um, when it comes to the afterlife, that what we receive in religions, there's a whole lot of metaphorical information there because this is something that's outside our, our knowledge. It's a bit like um, when, the, when you're a fetus in the womb. It's no good someone <clears throat> giving a lecture to the pregnant mother about what things are like out here. The fetus isn't equipped to understand that. But that doesn't mean that you're not here and the fetus is there and going to be built. So there are all kinds of difficulties in that kind of... So lots of religions engage in metaphor. Difficulties when the metaphor pertains, literally. So the metaphors are different. In the West, we've had this idea of heaven and hell, but the, the soul moving on. In the East, the metaphor is that of reincarnation, and that is the sensation that the soul comes back in some form or other, and that there are several returns to this planet. So the Baha'i faith says that hell is remoteness from God, and heaven is closeness to God, and it's a spiritual world. It isn't a physical one. Um, the idea of hell fire and you suffering in hell fire well, your body is what suffers but your body isn't there anymore your body's in the ground or it's been consumed by flames um, so it's not it, this, is a, this is a metaphor one of the things Baha'u'llah says is that when you die you'll realise what you've done on this planet and if you're a pure soul 
and your deeds have not been good, you're going to be in anguish simply by that knowledge. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that, that, I think that's probably the main difference to that is, is that we think reincarnation is as a metaphor, just like uh, the, the flames of hell as a metaphor. Mm. The, uh, the Universal House of Justice used that very metaphor recently when it talked about so many uh, the veiled, I think it's fairly obvious which group they were talking of. They say they, they, they stride towards hell fire and call it light. And I think we can think of some very virulent though people in the world who claim to be supporting religion but to turn the planet into hell is the Baha'i faith a religion or spiritual science it's I think it, it depends what you mean religion means bringing people together and it's a world religion it's recognised as a world religion it's recognised as one of the nine religions in the United Kingdom is, uh, that's Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Zoroastrianism, and Jains. They're the other eight. So there's one of the Baha'i Faith, one of those nine. And it's a religion. It has, we believe, A, that our founder has brought a book, he's brought guidance for humanity, he's brought the laws which humanity needs to, to abide by to bring itself peace and understanding and, and unity. It has a uh, various pilgrimages it has all the things that religion has and here we need to distinguish between what is a religion um, Christianity is a religion but the different churches of Christianity are parts of that religion they're not religions on their own so if someone changes from being a church of England and becomes a Roman Catholic they have not changed their religion they've changed their church they still believe in Christ. They're still Christians. They still read the Bible. Same religion, different church. Because of the covenant with Baha'u'llah, the Baha'i faith doesn't have different sects. It's completely united. Because of this administration, it's, it's completely united so that the Universal House of Justice sends out its Rizwan message to all the countries in the world where Baha'is are. And I don't know how many countries Baha'is are in now, but some 30 years ago they were in over 206 and it was the second most widespread religion after Christianity not numerically but its spread was enormous I always say it's a bit like the use of butter in the depression you spread it thinly but to all parts of the bread so it, it, it spread it's, it's, it's very much a religion and, and people join it as a religion as the fulfilment of religion the latest stage of religion only the latest stage of religion Baha'u'llah again at Rizwan said there won't be another manifestation of God for at least a thousand years but that means that in a thousand years yes there'll be a need for more because we'll always need this guidance from God we can never get all of it we never know it all what the message will be in a thousand years time I don't know because I'm not there maybe unity of the solar system maybe we'll have contacted other planets and found there are people on other planets but Holder actually says that uh, there are uh, the, the earth is not the only place where life exists on the universe quite categorically so who knows but uh, it hasn't finished but this is the latest stage and there won't be another one for a thousand years well, about 930 now, but <laughs> <laughs> because this is now the Baha'i year 171, so it's 171 years. We have our own calendar, which is, which sounded strange, 19 days or 19, 19 days, 19 months, and then the intercalary days to make up the 365 or 366. And then it seemed even weirder when we looked at the fact that we had, Nine, every 19 years becomes a bucket and that's a particular cycle and then you look at the universe and you see that every 19 years the planets all line up so having a cycle based on 19 years is actually fully in accord to the way the universe works and the sun and the moon and all the different stars and so on and then you think oh well, that actually makes scientific sense just as much sense as having 30 and 31 um, especially when you think that the month the word month comes from the moon. Month is, uh, is based on the phases of the moon, on the lunar uh, calendar, as it were. I don't know what the question was now, because I wandered clean off the topic. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, how did the Baha'i faith become the official re- religion of the United Nations? Well, now you're telling me something I didn't know because I wasn't sure that it had. <laughs> but I think, uh, remembering that Baha'u'llah exhorted the kings and rulers to uh, join together, to come together in a great congregation and to work out by consultation and negotiation the difficulties between them. And... Uh, I think I can't remember if I told you what their response was. That Napoleon III said that this is a god unto gods, and then got another tablet saying, for what you said, what you've done, your kingdom's going to be taken from you, which of course it was just three years later. And the, and the Kaiser was warned, um, O Banks of the Rhine, we have seen you covered with gore, and as much as the swords of retribution were drawn against you, and you shall have another turn. And we hear the lamentations of Berlin, though she be today in conspicuous glory. And you've just got to look at the history of Germany in the 20th century, and you can see that one lining up. So he, he wrote about uh, this, this the essential nature of this coming together. Uh, the only monarch who received his message any sort of courtesy was actually Queen Victoria, um, who said, if this is of God, it will endure. If it's not, it can do no harm. And to Queen Victoria, he actually praised her on two counts. Firstly, for doing away with the slave trade. And secondly, because she had resigned the reins of council to the representatives of the people. But then he said that these representatives had had a high degree of integrity and be concerned with the welfare of the people and the welfare of the world and so on. He gave a whole checklist, in other words, of what a politician should be. I did show that to our local MP, Andrew Rosendale, in my case. <laughs> He said, yes, um, we, we do aspire to that, he said, <laughs> but we don't all make it. Um, so when the League of Nations and now the United Nations started, obviously the Baha'is are going to support this because this is a step towards that great congregation of leaders coming together to negotiate um, the problems they have between them. And so the Baha'i faith for all oh, 40 or 50 years has been a non-governmental organisation attached to the United Nations. And we've given various uh, addresses uh, we, we, the Universe House of Justice 1985 brought out a book called The Promise of World Peace which was given to all the leaders of the different uh, nations in the world so if we've been appointed as, as the official religion I think it's because the Baha'is are regarded um, highly in the United Nations because of the inclusiveness of their teachings and because of their support for anything to do with world unity and bringing the world together and keeping it away from disaster What will a one world religion government look like? Ah, oh, uh, We'll find that out when it comes um, One thing it, w- it would have firstly it would have um, collective security Bahá'u'lláh said in, in the future if one king rises up against another all nations should universally restrain it and stop it it will have representatives from all countries in the world and it will be a kind of federal world as it were nations will relinquish the right to make war for example um, and you're it and you'll uh, subsume some rights into the, into the future of, of the um, but the, the actual nature of it is, is unknown because it will be something that's really come about through so the uh, combination of the leaders of the world I think and uh, the universe house of justice of course will be giving guidance on that so uh, we'll have to wait and see the actual <laughs> <laughs> but it will it will work on that of course on the situation where you have one world. Baha'u'llah said the world is one country and humanity is citizens. So there will be citizens of a world. The time for nationhood has actually passed. That, uh, that c- came about years before. Um, patriot- we are central, a sensible patriotism is exalted on us. But um, nationalism, my country right, your country wrong, is inconceivable, especially when you consider uh, the fact that now we're a world we all come from different places we're all a mix anyway and uh, to, li- to line us up as just one country is is no longer relevant uh, and uh, I always think when people talk about asylum seekers and how bad it is I always think well my ancestors were asylum seekers in the 16th century so who am I to start talking out about them I wouldn't be here <laughs> if it hadn't been for that that was because of they were Huguenots and there was persecution in France um, now, the Baha'i faith seems um, a lot like humanism. 
Um, how does humanity still connect with the creative outside of doing good works and service to others? Well, I think there's an old saying about proof of pudding is in the eating. And uh, when it comes to life after death, for example, Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, said that there is a huge difference between those who do not believe in God and don't do good things and those who don't believe in God and do. He said that, that it's, it's your deeds on this earth, deeds, not words, but your adorning, it's your deeds on this earth that are rewarded in the, in the life beyond. And this aligns up all through. Christ, for example, said, um, uh, I was in prison, you didn't visit me. I was hungry, you didn't give me any food. I was thirsty, you didn't give me any water. And they said, well, when did we not do that? He said, if you didn't do it to anyone, you didn't do it to me. Push off, call yourself Christians, forget it. That's, that's sort of... <laughs> Uh, not exactly those words but that's the gist of what he said and so this has always been it's it's your deeds that are important um Bahá'u'lláh says for example um that your attitude to work should be that of worship that your your work is a service to humanity and, and the role of service is, is very high and so I, I think it's people i mean for example we've got humanists that are in the unsacred for example and baha'is voted for them to be there as oh thank you very much for joining can, us here can today. i end by the prayer oh uh, yeah that's fine, sort of yeah. prayer of baha'u'llah um this is a unity prayer i, I might say a very short healing prayer for people are, is anyone sick at the moment this is for you thy name is my healing oh my god and remembrance of thee is my remedy nearness to thee is my hope and love for thee is my companion Thy mercy to me is my healing and my succour in both this world and the world to come. Thou verily art, the all-bountiful, the all-knowing, the all-wise. And if we've just got time for this short unity prayer. O oh my God, O oh my God, unite the hearts of thy servants and reveal to them thy great purpose. May they follow thy commandments and abide in thy law. Help them, O oh God, in their endeavour and grant them strength to serve thee. O God, leave them not to themselves, but guide their steps by the light of thy knowledge and cheer their hearts by thy love. Verily thou art their helper and their Lord. And lastly, blessed is the spot and the house and the place and the city and the heart and the mountain and the refuge and the cave and the valley and the land and the sea and the island and the meadow where mention of God hath been made and his praise glorified. Uh, Thank you very much, John, for that. And thank you very much for joining us here today at Radio Harold Hill. Um, And thank you listeners. Make sure to tune in same time next week at www.radioharoldhill.co.uk